Reconciliation. It's a big word you don't hear a lot, isn't it? We hear it a lot during Lenten season. Getting right. Getting right with others. The call of reconciliation, it's at the very heart of the Christian way. This Christ-like lifestyle that we're trying to live out, that we struggle with every day because of our humanity. Reconciliation is at the heart of it. It's also at the heart of the readings that we've heard so far today and that I'm going to continue on sharing here. In Joshua, the sign of the circumcision reassures the Hebrew people of God's forgiveness and love. It was this forgiveness and love that liberated the Hebrews from the stain of slavery and unbelief. An unbelief that caused years of wilderness wandering. The psalmist in our responsive reading today, Psalm 32, proclaims that a refusal to confess our sins and wrongdoing leads to pain and turmoil in our lives. But confession, confession opens us. It opens us to God's forgiveness and restoration. In the letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul celebrates God's gifts of new life and reconciliation in Christ. Calling believers to a ministry of reconciliation, not just with God, but with others. The parable of the lost son describes a father's willingness to receive his rebellious child back. And raises the question of how two estranged brothers might find one another again. These scriptures and, and far more that are contained in our Bibles are about so much more than our personal salvation, friends. God's word invites us to participate in the world's healing. As we learn to give and receive forgiveness. And it teaches us how to be reconciled with God. And with one another. Let me share this parable. The parable of the lost son. And I'm going to be reading from our gospel according to St. Luke chapter 15. You'll see it on the screen too. I add a little bit. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. Woo! Dissolute living. We don't use that word much. Jerry, did you use that word this week? I, I haven't used it either until now. Yeah. <laughs> dissolute living. When the younger son has spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed his pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, 
His father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one. Put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. And get the, the fatted calf and kill it. Let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And called to one of the slaves and asked, what's going on? The slave replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then the older brother became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered the father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I hope this uh, gospel text for this fourth Sunday in the seasonal lens is familiar to you. Has anyone ever heard this story before? Once or twice, once or twice before. I remember it from three years ago and three years ago before that preaching it. It's often called the, the parable of the prodigal son, right? Sometimes in some Bibles it's called the parable of the loving father. Did you know that? Hmm. Kind of seems appropriate. Prodigal in the Bible, it means rashly or wastefully extravagant. So calling it the parable of the prodigal son doesn't sit well with me. My Bible doesn't call it that. It calls it the parable of the lost son. We're going to go over that. But I think one son does act rashly and wastefully extravagant. All right, you make your own decision. But this is a parable, a story. It's a story about wanting and searching for what seems lost but actually is always within reach if we know where to look. It was the madness of wanting. The madness of wanting that drove the younger son to make his outrageous request, his offensive request. This is how I take it. This is how I take that the conversation went. The younger son goes to his father and says, Why aren't you dead yet? Dad, your value to me is in the stuff that will be mine one day. My value's in that, not in you. I think whenever I read this and I get through this first part here I get that sense that I just shared I think if ever there was a son that needed slapped across the face this is the one right here in the Bible I said this person just needs the open hand but he wasn't slapped was he my, my Bible doesn't record a talking to from the dad, a scolding, if you will, a correcting. It doesn't. 
It doesn't talk about any punishment for this blatant disrespect that the youngest son shows to the father. Instead, the younger son gets, receives exactly what he asked for. The father did what no other father would do. He broke the bank, broke tradition too. Broke open his wallet and took the money out. Took it all out. The younger son, the prodigal, the one who acts rashfully, wastefully extravagant, ran away once he got that money. Woo! Ran as fast as his feet would take it. He ran to satisfy that wanting. And he tried everything. He tried everything his fevered brain could think of, but nothing he tried slowed down the wanting. And I gotta give him credit. I gotta give him some credit. Come on now. He tried everything. The Bible has a big old list of stuff. He was working it. Top to bottom, he was trying the town out. Wearing out his sandals, moving from one place to another. I mean, he kept trying, he kept searching, he kept digging that hole deeper and deeper until he came to a point in his life where he had to look up to see rock bottom. Anyone been there? He used up all that he was entitled to. The wad of cash his father handed over evaporated like drops of sweat on a hot sidewalk. And he watched his fortunes fade as he plodded along. That hunger as strong as ever. That wanting that just wouldn't cease. Still there. That unsatisfied emptiness still driving him on. Until knee deep in a muddy pigsty, slopping the hogs of some farmer, he came to himself. He came to himself. The wanting changed. Did you, did you pick that up? The wanting changed in our story of this young man. He came to himself. The wanting was deeper. It was more real. And now it was within reach. Instead of wanting the something indescribable, he wanted something he knew well. Something he had experienced. He came to himself and wanted what he had already. What he'd already had. What he already had and had thrown away. That's what he wanted. And he, know, he knew he was no longer worthy of it. I mean, we hear rehearsing. He starts rehearsing. I'm no longer worthy. But he took a risk and decided that even a taste of what he had was better than this. He'd take the punishment. He knew, he realized that he couldn't have it all. That he'd have to be content with what he got. That he would suffer the indignity. He'd accepted that. I'll go back and I'll take it. Gladly. I'm knee deep in pig mud. I don't know how many of you like pig mud. I've been in it. I lost a boot in uh, cow mud. Woo I was walking on my mud boots, took another step, my boot was back there, sock foot in. Those socks no longer exist. They were burned up that day. Woo! Don't lose a boot in animal mud, I'll tell you that much. He knew he'd suffer the indignity of men. He deserved it. He knew that. 
but he knew he was done wanting. So he made the long journey back, leaving his madness behind. But then a strange thing happens. This is the craziest parable you ever read. Strange thing happens. His father had been waiting this whole time. Looking out off the front porch or out the front window every day down the road to the city. He'd been watching. And sees him. And not just that. that. That's just not the weirdest part of it. His dad, who he'd been so disrespectful to, so bad to, comes running down the road at him, full tilt. Running to meet him. Grabs him in a big old bear hug. The kind that says, I ain't gonna let go. And treats him as worthy. Treats him as worthy. Holy cow. Treats him as though he was a son. Treats him as though he belongs there. Right there in his arms. And then, before he knows it, the young son is swept into a party. He's welcomed home. Where he now has all he had ever wanted. End of the story, right? It's the end of the story. Not quite, right? Not quite. The wastefully extravagant, rashly acting younger brother who had now returned and was rejoicing with his father, had an older brother. Had an older brother. And the brother, the one who was left behind, the one who chewed on his frustration over his younger brother every day as he marched out to that field to work with the other hands, doing the work of two men now, I just think his satisfaction in his work and in his home and in his family had evaporated like drops of sweat on that hard packed dirt that he struggled to turn over every day. He stumbles back from that hot field, being out in the sun all day. That great day of transformation. Feeling anything but transformed. It was another day of back-breaking work, doing the work of two. And he hears the news. He hears the news, all right? And his face becomes even harder, all right? Becomes that bitter look, like, like whenever you bite into a sour apple, that first reaction face, bitter. Mm. He's standing out there kicking at the dirt. Our Bibles tell us his father found him. His father found him. Went out to him. Found him upset, spit and pounding his feet into the ground that he worked. And full of hatred. Full of hatred. The father embraced him. Embraces him in one of those hugs that says, I'm not going to let go. And begged him to come in and celebrate. But he refuses and said, I've slain for you all these years and you never gave me a thing. I see the father holding him out just a bit and saying, never really? Wait a minute. Is that what you believe? Let's look at this all again. And I say this because if you go back to the start of this story, our Bibles tell us that when the younger son asked for his part of his inheritance, the father gave them both their share. 
Does anyone know how it works in Jewish households for the oldest son? Anyone know how that works? The oldest son gets all the property. I mean, we're talking. The oldest son gets all the house, all the property, and half of the money. All right, now I got three brothers. All right? So my older brother would get the house, the property, half the money. Me and my three brothers get a split of the other half of money. All right? And now if we want to stay there, we're going to work for our older brother and respect his authority. That's how it worked. And the father had already given that inheritance to the older brother. It's what our Bibles tell us. The older brother got his too. Every day when he went to work, it was his. It was his. You hear me? Everything was his. Double his brother's share, all right, because he was older. But he never saw it that way. He didn't see it that way. He never claimed it. He never grasped that thought or understood it properly. He, he actually was living the party that his brother dreamed of knee-deep in that pig mud. That's what his father told him there, standing in the yard. But I don't know, in our Bible, the way it goes, it seems to say that his bitterness, his jealousy, just kept him from claiming it all these years of his hard work. Kept him from the joy, from living it. Really, every day, he went out with that wanting in his heart, too. That wanting. Now, what we'll never know, because Jesus doesn't tell us, was it, did the older brother ever come to himself? Did he ever understand this? The younger brother... It took near starvation to be able to leave the madness behind. But all we're left with is the hope that the older brother needed only almost losing his younger brother for he himself to move from wanting to generosity, from turning inward to pouring outward, just like his father. Like our father in heaven does for us. My friends, uh, I haven't lived as long as many of you, but i got to tell you that I believe every life teaches us something. All right? I believe every life offers us something. If only a chance to love more, to care more, to give more. And the abiding hope that I have found is that the lost can be found. It's a season of Lent. This is a parable of reconciliation, of getting right with God right with each other. Our Lenten season question from last week is the same question we're ending with today. What are we living for? Are we living God's call to be reconciled with Him and with others? You have to answer that. Amen.